Chapter 2. Choral Singing in Ancient Israel. The second in a series of podcasts on the history and nature of Jewish choral music. The earliest evidence of professional-level choral singing in Jewish worship is to be found in the Hebrew Bible. Now, technically, the Jewish religion as we know it today developed around the same time as the birth of Christianity, but the origins of Judaism can be traced at least 3,000 years back to the religion of ancient Israel and Judea. For about a thousand years, from about the year 1000 BCE to the year 70 of the Common Era, the focus of all sanctioned Israelite religious activity was a central sanctuary, or temple, in Jerusalem. King Solomon is credited with building the first sanctuary in Jerusalem just under 3,000 years ago. But his father, King David, is credited with authorizing the leaders of the Levite tribe to establish a professional choir and orchestra to enhance the sacred service. These ensembles were comprised exclusively of men from the tribe of Levi. From the book of First Chronicles, King David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers to sing joyful songs accompanied by musical instruments lyres, harps, and cymbals, for the service of the house of God, by order of the king. The total number of the trained master singers of the Lord was 288. Here we see an artist's depiction, based on historical evidence, of the Levite musicians standing on the 15 steps leading to the sanctuary. The Mishnah, a collection of writings from several centuries that was compiled around the year 200 of the Common Era, attests that in the time of the Second Temple, there was a liturgical choir that comprised a minimum of 12 adult singers. In the words of the Mishnah, there were never fewer than 12 Levites standing on the platform, but there was no limit on the maximum number of singers. Children could enter the court of the sanctuary to take part in the service only when the Levites were standing to sing. They did not participate in playing harp and lyre, but with the voice alone, to add flavor to the music. One might wonder what kind of flavor would the children add to the music. Perhaps harmonizing at the extra octave. The parallel structure of the Psalms reflects an ancient antiphonal and responsorial choral performance practice. For example, here are the first few verses of Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a foreign people. Judah became God's sanctuary. Israel became his dominion. Each verse is divided into two sections, called hemistics. The first hemistic, when Israel came out of Egypt. The second, the house of Jacob from a foreign people. In verse 2, the first hemistic, Judah became God's sanctuary, and the second hemistic, Israel became his dominion. Notice the relationship of the first half of each verse to the second half. The second half is a variation on either all or some of the words in the first half. Israel 
is parallel to House of Jacob. Egypt is parallel to foreign people. Judah is parallel to Israel. And God's sanctuary is parallel to his dominion. This structure, characteristic of much of the Hebrew Bible, is called parallelism. So what are the musical implications of this binary structure? We might anticipate a division into balancing antecedent and consequent phrases. We also might expect a responsorial or antiphonal performance. Indeed, traditional performance practice of psalms in many contemporary synagogues and churches is based on this structure. In this practice, known as psalmody, the entire psalm is treated as a strophic composition, with the same musical pattern applied to each verse. Furthermore, each of the two hemisticks is allotted its own unique melodic pattern, with a half cadence at the end of the first hemistic and a full cadence at the end of the second. The example that follows illustrates antiphonal singing in the Jewish tradition. The first phrase, up to the first fermata, is sung by the soloist, and then the congregation responds with the second half of each line. Here is the first verse of Psalm 114 in a traditional Jewish psalmody from the Sephardic tradition. Set his the next example provides an example of antiphonal singing in a Christian tradition. The asterisk marks the point of antiphonal movement from soloist to choir, or perhaps from choir one to choir two. <laughs> Notice that in both of these traditions, each hemistic begins with the initium, the opening pitch, which then continues as the tonus currens, the running tone, sometimes called the tenor, a pitch that is repeated as many times as is necessary to accommodate the syllables. and then through a brief melodic formula to the mediant, a half cadence marking the end of the first hemistic. Then the second hemistic proceeds in a similar fashion and ends with a full cadence, the finalis. This pattern is then applied strophically to each verse of the psalm. This chant was considered traditional in numerous Jewish diaspora communities, communities that had enjoyed hardly any communication with each other before the modern era. <laughs> Meyam 
Havul Adonai Kavod Vaoz Hoir Rabos Yom Hoyeso Ki Almono Lamenat Seach Al Agitit Mis mor le David. The prevalence of this chant suggests a common origin in ancient Israel before expatriation and the emergence of separate diaspora communities. The common origin theory is reinforced by the similarity of the Jewish chant to the Gregorian chant, perhaps offering us some insight into the sound of a psalm as it was chanted before Christianity had split off from Judaism. You may want to perform these two versions of Psalm 114 with your choir split in two, one side performing a verse in the Jewish version, followed by the other performing the Gregorian chant. And you could follow that with Paul Caldwell and Sean Ivory's beautiful setting of that same chant in English for unison chorus, piano, soprano saxophone, and percussion. It's called The Lord's Wonders at the Exodus, and it's stunning. <laughs> 